friction between scientists and engineers when it comes to outer space travel? Yeah, they have different, they have just different priorities and different perspectives. So the scientist wants to get the best possible data to answer their questions. The engineer wants to keep the spacecraft happy and healthy. And those two things don't always go together. So um, the, you know, engineers are really happy to try and go the extra mile to get science, but they need to sort of understand why is it worth, is it worth putting in extra time for this? And, and the scientists need to understand the, the fundamental constraints of the spacecraft. So we don't want to break the spacecraft to get good science. Um, we are always, scientists are always really pushing the, the technology of the spacecraft really to its limits, pretty much whenever possible. And, uh, and so there is a natural friction there, but everybody ultimately has the same goal, which is to have a successful mission. And so you just need some people who can uh, sort of be the glue and, and pull folks together. Which did you find more fulfilling? being the planetary scientist or now reinventing yourself as an engineer? I find the, uh, the it's called science systems engineering. So I find being this facilitator and bridge more fulfilling um, because, uh, you know, I get to make the science happen. And uh, that has an impact across a broader, uh, a broader, swath of science topics. I like, I, I really love hearing from the scientists what they have learned, what I have helped enable, which has included things like um, discovering the ocean underneath the surface of Enceladus, um, a lot of stuff on Mars from, uh, you know, I worked on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter for many, many years, and um, just, you know, that the data from that is just sort of a, a hugely fundamental piece of the, the science community. Um, and most recently, I've worked on the Perseverance mission since, the, since about late 2012, early 2013. So uh, I, was, uh, I worked on the science definition team. So as we were deciding what, kind of, what, were the, what was the science that we wanted this rover to do, um, I was helping sort of shepherd the conversation and the discussion. And so for a period of time, the entire rover was basically a set of PowerPoint slides on my computer. And now it's an actual rover on Mars collecting wow. data every day. And I uh, saw it through from that beginning and then representing the, ins the interests of the scientists that are all around the world, being a person at JPL in the conversations with the engineers saying things like, oh, if you're going to make that decision, you can't, we need to make sure it's going to probably impact or have an effect on the, this particular instrument. We need to make sure that representatives from that instrument are in these design conversations. Um, I, helped, I helped design the operations process, the way in which the scientists and, uh, talk amongst themselves every you know if you put five scientists in a room you have seven ideas on what you seven opinions yeah. on what you should do and so I worked to how are we going to have the discussions and figure out a consensus of what we should do each day with the rover but also what planning software tools do we need and then working with the um, the programmers to and the um, the the interface designers to say like, okay, we need a targeting tool. We need to be able to see the images, you know, in a 3D production. You know, we need these different instrument teams are gonna use this. They're gonna need particular types of information uh, to make their decisions. And it needs to talk very smoothly to the rover planners, the people who are actually putting the arm down on Mars or driving to places on Mars um, and helping with the testing of that and just really um, sort of trying to build the framework for operations and then train the scientists and get them to all come together. So um, I love, I just really love that kind of work. And then I like that seeing the beautiful data that comes down, the really awesome pictures, and, and then, um, you know, listening to them just discuss what they think it might be, like the stuff mm. that we're seeing. Is this 
uh, you know, what kind of, is this a volcanic rock? Is this sedimentary rock? Is it form, is it from a lava flow? Is it from, uh, you know, mud deposited by a river or in a lake? And like listening to how hard it really is to tell the difference between those sometimes on Mars and, uh, and just, you know, sort of being along for the ride as we build up this picture of, uh, of what Mars used to be like. If it's a sedimentary rock though on Mars, is, is there water there now currently? No. So wouldn't it wouldn't it fossilize or something and turn into something non sedimentary? Um. So, uh, a sedimentary rock is just fundamentally uh, pieces of rock that have been broken off mm -hmm. from somewhere and traveled by wind or water to a new location and deposited and then slowly compressed to form uh, okay. a solid rock. So that's like mudstone, sandstone, things like that. Um, a volcanic rock, uh, depending on the conditions that it forms in, it can, um, uh, it'll have little crystal grains from the different minerals growing and you know, by the what what kind of crystals and the size of the crystals can tell you a great deal about the conditions that it formed in. But the thing is, is that on Mars, all of the original rocks are volcanic. So you have little pieces of volcanic rock mm -hmm. broken off and traveling. So even your sand, oh. like the chemistry of your sand is going to be uh, ultimately match a lot of the, the volcanic rocks. Okay. Um, and it's just that you'll, you'll, you might see that it's got... Um, more interactions with water along the way if it was if it traveled via lakes and rivers and things like that. You mentioned something about five minutes ago. Insolidescence? Insolidence. Did I'm, I? I'm saying it wrong. What is in, it was it was something that was discovered or it was a, a vehicle or something. I'm I totally am, am pronouncing this wrong. Uh you said it in passing. <laughs> And I, I wrote what it. What is there con context, please? Because I'm not getting. The... I just I, I wrote because it, it it was in, it was in a science statement. Oh, Enceladus. Enceladus. What Enceladus. Is it? What Enceladus is, that? is thank you. Enceladus is a moon of Saturn. Okay. It is. If you ignore the sun, it is one of the brightest objects in the solar system. Um, and it turns out that it's this it's this little moon. Um, it's you know if you just sort of the the diameter of the the moon actually like is is less than the width of the United States. It's hmm. not that big. It's a tiny place. It's a tiny place. It is, um, the surface is covered in water ice and it's really fresh water ice and that's why it's so bright. Hmm. Uh, so it's very reflective. And what we discovered with the Cassini mission to Saturn is that there's a plume, it's like a geyser of water coming out of the South Pole. And so we were trying to understand like what, how, so first it was like, wow, this is amazing. We've got a geyser coming out of the South Pole. Oh, oh my geyser, gosh. A geyser with water. With water, water ice. Okay. It's by the, it's, you know, okay. you're so far out there. It's so cold. It's, it's immediately ice. Um, and so what, you know, sort of a, how does this happen? Okay. There must be liquid water involved somehow. Um, and so what, uh, Ultimately, what we figured out is that it's a layer of, of water ice, and then underneath that, it's liquid water. And then there's the solid, uh, the solid rock. But there is the liquid water. But there is liquid water. Um, and it's because of, it's probably because of um, the gravitational pull of Saturn. It causes tidal forces. So just like on the Earth, um, the moon causes tides. And we mostly see that in the water, right, the ocean tides. Yeah. But there is a very, it's, you know, that, that can, it can have that same effect on rock. It just doesn't move as much because rock is just, is, is a stiffer material. Yeah. But if you are able to have a great enough pull on, on your rock, so it's, it just basically is, is squeezing, you're squeezing your rock a lot as it moves around and that can and, um, cause heat. And so it has, That's amazing. Little, so, so. Um, there's a, a number of moons we've discovered out in the outer solar system around Saturn and Jupiter that have this, uh, you know, the tidal effect has caused water just in, under the surface of the frozen surface of the moon. But then there's also Io, which is one of the moons of Jupiter, and it's actually got huge volcanoes because of the same effect, this tidal forces <laughs> from the planet.